series and this theme came from the book of Ezekiel. And I know all of you are like, oh, of course, Ezekiel. So familiar with that one. But Ezekiel 37 has a story that a lot of people have heard. And it's this interesting story where God tells the prophet Ezekiel to go out into this valley of dry bones. And so he's having this vision. And he walks out and there's this valley full of these dry, brittle bones. And God starts telling Ezekiel, hey, prophesy to these bones that they may live. Speak to them that they may come to life. And so Ezekiel does it, whether he really believed it was going to happen or not. He does it, and all of a sudden, it says that there was a rattling noise. And these bones came together, bone to bone, and this vast army stood before Ezekiel. And so God, in the context, he says, hey, this is what I'm going to do with Israel. See, at this point in history, Israel had been exiled in Babylon, so their place had been destroyed, and, and they pretty much just assumed, hey, as a people, like, we're cut off, right? We're, we're dead in our graves, and God says, well, wait, not so fast. Like these dry bones, I want to raise you up. Now, the reason I bring that up is because I feel like God spoke to me and said, I want to do the same thing with rhythm. I want to breathe new life into rhythm this year. I want to breathe new life. I want to do a resurrection work, a redemption work in the heart of the church. And so I'm very excited about this year. I believe that God is going to do amazing things. And, and the best part is just going to be able to stand back and watch, just to watch God move in supernatural ways. So very excited about that. Um, but the believing is not enough by itself. We can believe that something great is going to happen, but we also want to pray for power and we want to plan with purpose. So concerning prayer, we want that to be a foundational thing here at Rhythm. And so on your way out, there are some prayer guides that we're going to have um, either at the Welcome Center there or one of our greeters will have them as you're leaving. And essentially what this is, is it's going to give you a, a sort of a guide for the next couple weeks to pray for the church, to uh, pray for yourself, to ask God for his power to ask God for his presence for 2023. And so that's going to be a guide for you. Um, we're also, if you didn't know, we're starting a two-week fast as a church. And so starting tomorrow through the end of January, so that final Sunday in January, which I believe is the 29th, uh, and that can look different for everybody. So it could mean that you're going to get rid of TV for that period of time or social media or food or, or whatever that may look like. Um, for my wife and I, what we're doing is we're just going to forego a meal every day for those two weeks. And so the time we would have spent cooking or eating for dinner, instead we are going to spend that time praying, right? We're going to remove food. We're going to replace it with that time with prayer so that we can grow a relationship with God, so that we can see God move in power. And so that's something that I hope that you guys have um, thought about. I hope you've had some time to think of what that could look like for you. Um, it is worth noting, too, that during this time of fasting and prayer, it, it, you know, it's not irreverent if you want to pray for a Viking Super Bowl, okay? So you can just kind of add it in there during the season. Uh, if you're a Chiefs fan, Patrick Mahomes does not need your prayers, okay? <laughs> he sold his soul a long time ago. So I hope that you guys have thought about that. You're excited about what that could look like. Now, as far as planning with a purpose, we're going to commit to a few things as a church. We're going to commit to a few things that are going to help us, I believe, see this work of God. And, and listen, commitment is a hard thing. Even saying, hey, we're going to commit to this, some of us kind of squirm because we're like, ah, I don't like commitment, right? I don't want to be tied down. I don't want to have someone that's counting on me. Uh, there's times where I am either needing to work or needing to do um, schoolwork at the house. And, and so I work there, but then Kara is, you know, not doing that. And so for her leisurely time, she's like, hey, I'm going to either sit on the couch and read or she's going to sit on the couch and watch a movie. But the funny thing is, 
is whenever I get up to go to the bathroom or to get a drink or whatever, she's always watching a different movie every single time I get up. And I've asked her, like, what are you doing? Why will you not just finish a movie? And she's like, well, no, I don't want to watch a whole movie. I just want to watch my favorite parts of these five or six different movies. And I'm like, you either have commitment issues or you're a serial killer. <laughs> One of the two. So if I go missing, check the lake behind our townhome. But, but genuinely, commitment is, is sometimes hard, right? It, it's hard to, to commit to certain things. But commitment is foundational, especially for the life of the church. It's an intentionality and an effort that we need to put in if we want to see God move in powerful ways. And so the first thing that I want us to commit to this year, as we, we're already praying, we're fasting, we're seeking God, now we're planning. The first thing I want us to commit to is I want us to commit to gather. Commit to gather. And, and I know that may seem like a given, because we're going to have service every week here apart from maybe a blizzard, right? I, I mean, if you are myself or a volunteer, like you can't necessarily just get up on on Sunday and be like, hey, you know what? I'm not feeling it today, right? We're not going to gather today. So I know that it's sort of a given because we are going to be here every week. But let's be honest, it is very easy, especially on those particularly cold days, to just sort of skip the church, right? Skip gathering together on Sundays. It was easy for me. I, there was a, a period of time where I wasn't a pastor. I've done ministry for a long time, but there was a time where I wasn't a pastor and I was a part of a church, but man, it was easy to sleep in. Like, man, it was so easy to just be like, you know, I don't feel like committing to this today. But we're going to see through this passage of scripture in Hebrews that our gathering together weekly as a church is crucial for the grounding of our faith and for the growth of our faith. So if you have a Bible, go and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. If you don't have one, no worries. We're going to have it up on the screen. We're going to look at Hebrews 10 verses 19 through 25. And in this, we're going to see four reasons that gathering together as a church is so important. So Hebrews 10 starts like this. It says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good works, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So the structure of this passage is interesting, because in the middle, sandwiched in between, you have the four reasons that gathering as a church regularly is important, prioritizing that, committing to that. But you also have sort of the, the start and the finish as well. Again, I like food, so in terms of sandwiches, you got this stuff in the middle, but you got the bread right here and the bread right here. And that's the thing that's holding this passage together. So if you think about it, and if you were here during our tension series, this might sound familiar, but it's bookended with both of Jesus's advents, Jesus's arrivals here on earth. So it starts by talking about the blood of Jesus, his first advent, when Jesus came down and died for us. And then the passage ends by talking about Jesus's second advent when he comes to restore all things. If you notice, there's that phrase, the day approaching, and day has a capital D, because it's not just talking about a day, it's talking about the day when Jesus arrives to restore all things. And so you have this framework going, okay, Jesus has come, we live in a broken world still, and Jesus will come, 
So let's talk about why gathering is important in the meantime. Because we're all on a journey from where we are now to glory. We're all on this journey. And unfortunately, for a lot of us, we, myself included at times, have this idea that this journey, this walk is going to be sort of like a walk in the park. You know, it's going to be easy. It's going to be breezy. We got no problems. Everything's fine. No suffering. We're just kind of going to go through life, blessing upon blessing upon blessing until we eventually get to glory. And if that's the pattern, then sure, church is not really that important, I guess, because, hey, everything's good. We're just going to keep going and do our thing, not be sidetracked. But the reality is, is, is life, this journey of faith, is not always a walk in the park. Sometimes it's a little bit more like that show Wipeout. You guys ever seen that before? If you haven't, you should. Uh, it's fun. You are laughing at other people's pain, but it is fun. Because in this real-life experience, you are hit with temptation. You deal with suffering. You deal with hurt and betrayal while your friend laughs at you. You deal with false teaching and these different ideas coming to you from all around. And, and you're sort of hit on all sides. And if that's what it looks like, the church makes a lot of sense. Gathering makes a lot of sense. Because if that's what life looks like, then we need each other. We need each other to help us on this journey. So let's look at this. Four reasons. The first reason, when we gather, we are reminded of the work of Jesus. When we gather, we're reminded of the work of Jesus. Again, that's how he starts. In Hebrews 10, he says, Therefore, brothers and sisters... Since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is, Jesus' body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God. Let's approach God with a sincere heart, with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. If you've never read the book of Hebrews before, it has a lot of Old Testament imagery. So there's times where you read it and you're going, I don't exactly know what he means by this, this priest thing, this sacrifice, the water, all that. And so in this moment, he's using Old Testament imagery. In fact, I have a diagram up here that will kind of help us understand this a little bit. But what he's talking about is he's talking about the most holy place. Okay, so if you look at it, you have this outer courtyard on the far right, so that's where you enter, and that's where the Levites and the priests would do their sacrifices. But then beyond that, you have the holy place, and that is where only the priests could go. They would go and burn incense in there. Um, they would go and make sure that the golden lampstand that was in there was still lit to symbolize God's light. And then Beyond that, you had the Holy of Holies. And you notice the little pink line there. There was actually a curtain or a veil, a very heavy one, that covered that area. And that was a place that only one person, one time a year, could enter. It was the high priest. So the high priest could only enter the most holy place one time a year. And even then, he had to make sure that he was washed he had to make sure that he brought a, a blood offering of some kind. And so it's a really big deal. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying, unbelievably, he's saying, hey, this applies to all of us now. We all, because of the blood of Jesus, have access to Christ. We all get to walk into the most holy place, into the presence of God not because we are covered by the blood of a sacrifice or goats or whatever it is. We are covered by the blood of Jesus. And so he's saying everyone has this access. And so that means whether personally when we are spending time with God or, or whether corporately as a church when we are gathering together, 
we are reminded of the blood of Jesus that binds us together. We're reminded of the work of Jesus. Because if you're anything like me, it is very easy to forget. I am a very forgetful person. I can forget little things, like a coupon on the counter that I'm like, hey, I got to make sure I bring this with me when I leave. I leave, it is still on the counter. I am a very forgetful person. But this is probably the easiest thing to forget. It's so easy to forget that, that Jesus really has died in our place for our sins, and now we have a right relationship with God. And so when we come together as a church, it recenters us. It recenters us on what Jesus has done. We get to approach God knowing that we are not guilty before him if we've trusted Christ. And so gathering together is so important because it reminds us of Jesus. Now, the second reason that this weekly gathering is important is because when we gather, we are grounded in the faith. Again, verse 23, if we look back at it, he says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. I think the writer of Hebrews here is being a realist. He knows that there are going to be times on this journey where our grip feels weak, or there are going to be times on this journey where our faith feels unsteady. And so he's saying, hold on, stay grounded in your faith. Now, the greatest promise in this is the end where it says that he who promised is faithful. So our greatest assurance is that Jesus himself will guard us and ground us in the faith. But so often Jesus uses the church to do this in our lives. So if there's times where we feel like we are having a spiritual vertigo, where we're struggling with some things, or, or maybe life feels shaky, the gathering together weekly is a chance for us to get further grounded. Now, yes, you can approach God by yourself. You can spend time with God by yourself. You can do that wherever you want. But when you come to gather as a church, you get to get out of your own head. You get to get with other people who are going to help you stay grounded in your faith. And so the gathering of the church is important because of that. Now, this is not a statement that it's not a hundred percent all-encompassing statement but sometimes i have noticed that when i have friends that have walked away from the faith a lot of times they walked away from the church first now that's not to say that the church has always been innocent there are people that have walked away from the church because of hurt or bad experiences or whatever that may look like, and that's very real. But I've had many friends at times that have walked away, and it started with walking away from the church. And, and I think that is the case because, again, when you're not gathering regularly, encouraging each other, grounding each other in the faith, it's a lot easier to, like a balloon, sort of wander away. It's a lot easier to drift away it's a lot harder to do that when you have people that are holding you down. And that's part of why we gather. Now, the third reason is when we gather, we are provoked to a more active faith. And I use that word provoked on purpose. See, this verse says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. But this phrase, spur one another on, can also be translated as provoke one another. And it's interesting because usually the word provoke is a negative thing. And so I think the writer of Hebrews is doing this on purpose. See, the only other time that you see this 
word in the New Testament is when the Apostle Paul and Barnabas says they have a sharp disagreement, and then they split from one another. And so it's usually a negative word. But I think the writer of Hebrews is onto something. Let's think about it in the negative sense. We all do things that provoke one another at times. If you're married, this is especially true, because over time you have learned the best ways to provoke one another. You have learned the things that work the best. For instance, if I want to provoke my wife, if I want her to be mad at me because I'm an idiot, then what I'll do is is one of three things. Um, One, I can take the dirty dishes that I just finished using and put them in the clean sink instead of putting them in the dishwasher where they belong. I just saw someone's wife hit their husband on the leg. Not going to point it out, but (laughs) yep. So if I want to do that, my wife gets so frustrated because she's like, I just cleaned the sink. Can you not see that? Why are you putting your dirty dishes here? And I'm like, look, honey, I am just an idiot, okay? I bow before you and, and, you know, we just move on. Another thing is that on trash day, if I forget to take out the trash and leave it out for the trash people to get the next day, my wife gets so mad at me. Like in that moment, I am just another bag of trash in her life, (laughs) stopping her from happiness. Because she knows, hey, this is not going to come back for another week, and this thing is already full. Uh, A third one is if I wake her up before her alarm clock goes off. Anyone feel that? Raise your hand if you feel that. If you're just like, "That's, that's me, okay? So my wife, she doesn't sleep. She hibernates, and there's a difference. So if I wake her in the middle of the night or at 5 in the morning, 6 in the morning, whatever it is, then she is not happy in those moments. And again, in that moment, she is a bear that has been awoken from her hibernation, and I am a lowly salmon that is ready to get filleted. (laughs) I know how to provoke her. Usually I try not to do those things, but if I wanted to provoke her, those are the things that I would do, and thankfully, she's patient and lovely and wonderful. But think about it. When you provoke someone, you are stirring something up in them. You are stirring something up. You are bringing something out of them. If I'm going to provoke you, I am bringing anger out of you, or I'm bringing frustration out of you. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, let's do that as a church, but let's flip it on its head. Let's provoke each other. Let's push each other, spur each other on so that we bring out the good in us. We spur each other on. We provoke one another to do good deeds, to love people better. And so he's saying provoke one another. Bring bring stuff out of each other, but for the kingdom, for the glory of God. And again, that is only possible if we gather as a church. Because this gives us a time where we are surrounded by people that can spur us on. If we only want to spend time with God on the boat, in the deer stand, wherever it may be, then we're not going to have the people around us that are going to help provoke us. And so we're going to probably slide into a pretty comfortable, nominal non-transformative faith. But when we gather, keeps us from doing that. Fourth thing, when we gather, we are encouraged to endure. We're encouraged to endure. Look at the last verse here. He picks up on his last thought. Says, we should not neglect meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So again, remember that framework. Jesus has come. He's coming again. So in the meantime, as we walk from here to glory, we need to encourage one another on this trip to endure, to keep going, to keep our heads up when life gets difficult. I've mentioned before that 
I, I'm a fan of movies. I love watching movies. And one genre of movie I really like watching are war movies. Uh, Saving Private Ryan, Black Hawk Down, Lone Survivor, so on and so forth. And I like these movies. One, they're just, they're very good. Um, but I like them because so many of them are true stories. And so it's fascinating to me that you're watching this crazy, entertaining movie and you're going, wow, there was people that actually did these things. That's amazing. And there was one movie a few years back that I watched that, that was a very moving movie, and it was a movie called Hacksaw Ridge. And in this movie, you have a guy named Desmond Doss, who is a soldier in the Battle of Okinawa, but there's a, a big difference between him and his fellow soldiers, and, and his difference is that he is a conscientious objector. So he doesn't want to hold or fire a gun because of his religious beliefs. And so throughout the movie, you see this tension rising where you know, his fellow soldiers are thinking, hey, man, you're useless. Why are you here? Why, like, why are you a part of what's happening here if you're not willing to do the main thing that we do? But over time, throughout the movie, you realize that this becomes embarrassingly not true, that his fellow soldiers were completely wrong. Because despite his unwillingness to carry a gun, he actually ends up getting a Medal of Honor for his bravery and his, his courage during this battle. Because what he does is in the middle of the night, when there are wounded American soldiers, and they're up on top of this ridge, hence Hacksaw Ridge. I actually have a picture of it here. So they're up on top of this ridge, and, and he can hear the people that are wounded up there calling for help. And so what he does is under the cover of night, he goes up there and he begins crawling around, sneaking around the dark, and he, he finds any American soldier that he can who is wounded but not dead, and he either drags them or he puts them on his shoulders and carries them to the edge of this ridge, and then he pulls them down. And, and in the end, it's said that he saved 75 people during that battle just from going up there in the middle of the night, going behind enemy lines and pulling his fellow soldiers to the cliff where they could lower them down and then they could get the medical help that they needed. And it's so moving because, again, you saw the picture of him hoisting a, a soldier on his back. I love that imagery because I think... That again, that's part of what our job as the church is. When we have days where we are struggling, when we have seasons where life is difficult and we sort of just want to like lay down and just, just be done with it, right? When we come and gather as a church, it gives us a chance to find our fellow believers that are struggling and it gives us a chance to put them on our backs and say, hey, I got you. I'll carry you for a little bit. I'll get you to safety. I'll get you to victory. Just, just don't give up. Just stay grounded. And so again, that's not possible if you're not a part of the gathering of the church. You can't encourage one another if there is no one around you to encourage you. And so during those times when you feel like it is just too much, know that at, at rhythm, it is okay to not be okay. The, the, greatest, the greatest danger, the greatest fear would be that that rhythm turns into a church where we check our baggage at the door. You know, where, it's, where when you get to the door, it's like, hey, man, make sure to to leave your struggles, leave your suffering, leave your sin, because we want the best version of you in here, not, not, not all the other parts. That's my greatest fear, because I don't want that, because that's not the church that Jesus came to set up. We should be able, this should be one of the safest places for us to come with all of our crud, 
and just be real and unload it and have people that can gather around us and help us. Now, it's okay not to be okay. Obviously, we don't want you to stay that way. We want to see God heal. We want to see God transform. But the reality is, is that that is not a bad thing to come in here with all the stuff that is going on, all the stuff that you are dealing with, and just laying it out in front of people who care about you, who love you. And so that's why gathering is so important. That's why we want to commit to gather, to make being here a priority because it reminds us of the work of Jesus. It grounds us in our faith. It pushes us to a more active faith and it encourages us to endure. And those are just four things. There's so many other reasons. But we want you to be here to be a part of what God is doing. A broken, imperfect church where we can come and we can worship a perfect, whole Savior named Jesus. That is our goal. Every time we walk in, we want to lift up, to exalt Jesus, to enjoy him. And then from there, we are transformed and we are sent out. We are deployed to go on mission with the gospel. So let's commit to gather this year as we watch God do amazing things as we watch him breathe new life into rhythm. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you for the church. God, thank you that the church is a place where we can experience all of these things. And God, I pray that that, that would be true of rhythm. God, I pray that we would remind each other weekly of what you've done. God, that we would help guard and, and ground each other in the faith. God, that we would help provoke one another to a more active, living, real faith. God, and that we would encourage each other to endure. And, and God, I pray that we would always be a church where it is okay not to be okay. But God, that we would also be a church where you don't let us stay that way, but you transform us more and more each day, each week. God, I pray for anyone in here who is struggling, God, who is um, going through a difficult time. God, would you give them mercy and grace and comfort? And God, would you Help them if they need to, um, to speak up about that, to be honest about that so that they can work through that hurt. And God, I pray for this year, God, that you would just fill our hearts with love for each other, love for the lost. God, you would give us a, a passion to see people saved. God, that you would give us a passion for you, spending time with you and growing to be more like you. God, we thank you that we have this, this joy and this privilege to gather weekly. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.